It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 36, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is J.M. Fortier, author of the award-winning book, The Market Gardener. At his farm in Quebec, J.M. and his wife raise one and a half acres of produce in permanent raised beds, grossing over $100,000 per acre. His biologically intensive farming practices have inspired readers around the world to imagine human-scale food systems with a focus on intelligent farm design, appropriate technologies, and harnessing the power of soil biology. We talked today about how J.M. and his wife came to their farm in Quebec, how they developed their approach to farming, and we get into the nitty-gritty of farming practices at Le Jardin de la Grillinette, sorry about the mispronunciation, including the proper use of the broad fork, JM's approach to record keeping, minimum tillage, and where to find the best waves for surfing in Montreal. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost. Founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. JM Fortier, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hey, Chris. I'm super glad to be here. It's really exciting to have you on the show. I think I think you're officially the biggest name on the show to date. So a uh, pretty, pretty exciting moment for me. Well, super, super stoked to, to be talking with you. I love the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. How's, how's the weather up in, in Quebec today? Well, you know, um, we're slowly getting into fall mode and, um, you know, temperatures have dropped. The light is dropping, but, you know, we still, I, I guess we still have light till, till 630. And uh, slowly we're preparing for what's coming ahead of us, which is a pretty cold winter usually kicks in and in December. Well, yeah, because you guys are just north of, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm very American centric. So you guys are just north of Vermont, right? Yeah, I'm an hour. I'm 45 minutes north of Burlington, which is one of my favorite town in the U.S. I, I like Burlington, too, but mostly for the Ben and Jerry's ice cream. <laughs> yeah. I thought it would be interesting because I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of my listeners have have read the book and are familiar with that. And I, I want to talk about some of the techniques that you use and that the, the you talk about there. But I thought it would be interesting to start off with with a little bit more of a history of of you and your family and the farm and kind of how you got there and and what that actually looks like now. Sure. Well, uh, neither my wife and I uh, learned farming at school. We we graduated in ecology in, in at McGill University, and um, that was in early two thousand. And you were, we were really motivated to make a difference somehow. And we were looking for all, an alternative lifestyle. And we made a trip and we went to Mexico, worked on coffee farms, fair trade coffee farms. We worked there for a little while. And then we moved up north and we went to New Mexico. And then we started to woof on a small organic farm. It was a two acre market garden around Santa Fe. And uh, the funny thing to that story was that it was a French Canadian, Richard (laughs) Belanger, that had been farming there for the last decade. And he was one of the better farmer out there. And um, so we we hooked, we connected with him. And, you know, obviously he was super excited to be speaking French. And so we, we really connected with him and we stayed there for five or six months farming with him. Really, you know, that was our first encounter with, with, with farming because, you know, I didn't grow up on a farm. I knew nothing about farming. I had zero understanding or interest in any of that. But there I was outside um, working with my hands. We were growing stuff and bringing it to market. And Bichar had a pretty funny nickname. He was called the Salad King because he was bringing in the best salad mix in all of Santa Fe. And people were lining up at his booth to get the salad from, from Rishar. And I was, I was doing the money box and I was like, man, this is pretty good stuff. <laughs> Rishar is packing $3,000, you know, per Saturday morning. And so, so my first encounter with farming was something that was small, something that was outside and beautiful because he, he, he was in Abiquiu, which is where Georgia O'Keeffe is from. So all the nice paintings. So the light was really amazing. And people were thanking him. People were thanking Richard for his work. 
And, and I, was, I was seeing that he was making money. And the story is that he would also spend two months uh, in Mexico to hang out. So I was like, wow, this is a pretty good lifestyle. And, and that's how I got into farming. I mean, I remember that first summer that I spent working on on a vegetable farm. Mine was over in Santa Barbara, California, and it was and going to farmers market and seeing some of that same stuff. But mostly that that piece about people being so thankful for getting good food that just that really went right to my heart. Uh, me, too. And I still remember to this day that we went to a farm, the farmers market in Santa Fe, and we talked to the the woman that was organizing the farmer's market. And we were asking her if she knew any farms where we could work. And that's, she was the one that pointed us to, to Richard. And she told us, you know what, guys, this is so positive. There's such a great positive energy around the farmer's market and, and the producer and, and the buyer that you'll be, I hope you'll, I'll hope you'll connect into that. And I've never forgotten that because that was ha- that's what sustained us through all of these years that we've been doing this was the people really appreciating our work and and the produce and the quality and the effort that we've put to get there and uh, you're right this is this is perhaps the reason why there's so many of us out there farming even if it's a hard trade You also talked about this idea of of doing something real out in the world to have a positive benefit that's not not just sitting at a desk, you know, making Facebook posts about local food or about the environment, but actually, actually living it. You know, I think there's a lot of, there's a, you know, there's a strong support for local organics and it's really important that this, this trend continues. But, you know, if, if people really want to make a difference, I think they need to put on their rubber boots and pick up farming because you know, I, I know in, in between us, between us farmers, we, we sometimes forget this, but, you know, local organics is just a tiny portion of what people are eating out there. So we need to multiply the farm. We need to we need to grow this kind of system. And, and so, I, you know, I'm a big advocate of that. And that's been one of my motivation to be, you know, an outspoken public figure about that. So you and your wife moved back to Quebec in... When, what year would that have been in? We came back in 2002 after staying with this, this guy, Richard Harmony Farm, it was called. We uh, became farm managers on a Montessori school because the the farm manager left in, in August. (laughs) And so these, these guys had a Montessori school and, and their campus was a farm, a market garden. And so they asked us if we wanted to take over the farm. And there we were after like four months of, of, you know, of of apprenticeship running this one acre market garden. And the reason why we had said yes is because the farmer that was there was doing such a poor work that we, 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 we knew we couldn't do any, any work. So we just took on the challenge and we stayed there for a year and a half. We learned so much because every week I would visit, uh, new farmers from the farmer's market. I would go to their farm. It was cool because now we were officially kind of like in the gang. We were farmers ourselves. We were the one bringing the produce at farmer's market. And I, I would go and see Don Bustos which with a big grower. There was a big grower over there and say, can I look in, uh, at your setup? Can I come and visit your farm? And for a year and a half, I visited about 20, 25 farms. And I was really looking at the details of everything because I was looking for solutions about how to set up what we were doing over there. And so we came back after almost two years in New Mexico. And uh, we came back to Quebec because our roots are from there. And because we like, you know, the French component of of who we are. And we rented land, a fifth of an acre. We set up a big teepee and we farmed there for two seasons before buying our own land. Living in a teepee in, in Quebec. Yeah, because we had seen a young couple in New Mexico, farming on, you know, a fifth of an acre with a teepee, hand tools and their <laughs> kids. And we thought, Jesus, this is the perfect romantic setup. But we hadn't made, you know, when you're young, sometimes you forget certain important things. But, you know, a teepee in Quebec is not the same thing as in Santa Fe. <laughs> so it was no. <laughs> yeah, it was a temporary shelter. And the best part about that is that we took these winters, these two winters, 
to travel down south. And one of the trip that we made was a really important one for us. And that was when we visited Cuba and we saw um, what are called organoponicos, which are permanent raised beds uh, with a cement contoured around them and intensively planted crops. And you would see acres and acres and acres and acres of these permanent raised beds. And so it was the first time we were visiting a cropping system that didn't have a tractor, but that was, you know, it, it was a lot of production. Wow. And, and that's, I mean, that seems to be something that you really brought back. I, I'm interested in the, in the permanent raised beds. Cause you talk about that in your book about, about doing this, not, not with the concrete edges around it, but really having permanent walking paths and permanent working areas. And it's interesting. One of the first interviews that we did on the podcast was, was with John Peterson at, at Angelic Organics and he's farming on a much larger scale, but he's actually put GPS in his tractors for precisely the same reason that you're doing the, the permanent paths yep. and the permanent beds. It's so that his wheels are always traveling in exactly the same spot. Yep. And he says that it's made an incredible difference in the yields that he's gotten and, and paid for the, the really expensive system that he put in place. Yeah. Well, for us, you know, permanent beds was an answer to the fact that when we bought the farm, it was a two and a half acre prairie. And so, you know, it was such a small parcel of land that when we were doing the farm design, just the, uh, just the, you know, the edge row for the tractor to turn at the end was taking up too much space. And so from the get go, we were thinking, let's just go without a tractor. And, and because the beds are permanent, then we don't need to be plowing, disking, hilling, shaping soil because we've done that once. And then we've been cultivating only the surface of these beds, um, you know, with a walk behind tractor or even with wheel hose. And so the whole concept of, of, permanent bed is to avoid working the soil because you're not, you know, you're not rolling over with something that is heavy. So you don't need to decompact it. And you're, so you're not compacting the soil. And, you know, I, I think that in Europe, all the farms that I, I, I visit now, most of them are on permanent beds. And I think slowly this is really trickling down to most of the growers I know over here. It's just a matter of finding the right tools to standardize your cropping system to a permanent bed system. Do you feel like that's easier to do at the very small scale that you're on? Yeah, because when we started all of the tools that we have, you know, we work on 70 uh, on 30 inch bed systems. We were following pretty much what Elliot Coleman had laid out in his book. And, right. and, and Elliot had been developing tools and importing tools with Johnny's. And most of them were standardized to 30 inch. And when we were looking for, um, you know, the, 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 the power, the harrows that we, we use on the walk behind tractor and the flail mower, everything was really, uh, easy to find on 30 inch. So that was really why we standardized to 30 inch. And that's, I mean, that's certainly what I've seen with the, well, I got one parked in my garage, uh, you know, it's a 30 inch rototiller from BCS yep. and that that is, I mean, there, it's pretty easy to find stuff that works that way. And I think maybe a little bit. Well, obviously easier on a hand scale to say, I'm going to stick to these thir this, this 30 inches with the tiller than it is on a tractor on a hillside, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that the, we've been using, you, you, you know what a power harrow is. It has the tine on a vertical shank and it doesn't invert the layers. Um, right. So it's kind of, I'm trying to think about how to describe that on the radio, but you know, I've got one finger pointing up or I guess a finger pointing down and I'm tracing a circle with it. And that's how the tines work on that. Yeah. Right. And instead of, yeah. of pulverizing the soil and, and mixing up the layers, it just gently kind of like it blends, but without, you know, without overhauling the soil. And we've been using a harrow since 2004. And when we were looking for one back then, you know, looking for something on a tractor was like $15,000. And I remember that we, we had paid a thousand eight hundred for ours back then. Now they're more expensive, but so it was for us, it was really a no brainer to, to go with a walk behind tractor. And, and really this works well if you're in a permanent bed system, because you don't need to be shaping soil, you know, every year come, come springtime, you know, we've shaped the beds in 2004 and we've been, just been surface cultivating ever since. And when you say shape the beds, you went through with shovels and were, were basically sinking down the paths and putting that soil onto the beds, yeah, right? That was, 
That was uh, the first job I did. Um, 180 bed. They're all 100 foot long because we've standardized the, the length of our beds. And uh, one scoop to the left, one scoop to the right. And there I went. Did that for three weeks. But I don't know, it was a lot. You're of, young, right? Well, I was. Well, I'm still young. I'm, I'm young at heart. <laughs> and, but I knew that I was only doing this once. So that makes a difference. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you're, you're designing your garden, you're excited. And, but, you know, honestly, when we did what we did, we, we really didn't know what we were doing. This was a whole big experiment. And I think it's because I had seen other stuff elsewhere and I was reading a lot of the permaculture book and stuff like that, that I got something that was good enough. And that then we got to optimize and, and really developed better over the years. So like, like what have you optimized and changed? Cause it's something I think, I mean, especially when you put everything into print, it, it kind of looks like you've been doing the same thing since you got started, right? It looks like you had this great idea, you did it and it, and it all worked out. So where did you, when you started with this, what have you changed? No, there, there was a learning curve for sure. The first few years we were, you know, the production really wasn't what it is now. So there was an evolution in that way. But also, you know, some of the tools that, that we've been using the last, you know, six, seven, eight years, they weren't around when we started or, you know, we didn't know about them. So it was, it was just about adding these pieces together. But, you know, one, one thing about my story, which is, is, is that we had a serious land constraint. And so that, that was, that is really the defining factor uh, of how we've, we've farmed the last decade is just we've had to intensify and, and develop from the inside because we just didn't have any more space to spread out. So we were always looking for ways to get more yields or more production or just become more efficient because we've had this constraint. And I, I think in, in, that was, a, that was the most, one of the most positive things that happened to us was this land constraint because it, it really forced us to to grow from the, the farm from the inside, which I think is, is there's a lot of value into that. So if we could go back in time to 2004 and I could, I could just gift you a 40 acre farm, would you take it? Well, yeah, I would take it. I would, I would perhaps take half an acre and, and leave the rest to the butterflies. And <laughs> I, you know, I didn't, I, the farms that I had worked on, they were all super small. And since we, we didn't grow up on a farm, just my model of what a farm should be like wasn't a big farm. And, and I need to be really honest also, Chris, most of the farms that I was visiting when I came back to Quebec, none of them were working on permanent beds with, with BCS tractors and, and, and a small scale intensive. They were all farming, you know, five, six, seven, ten 10 acres and doing 100, 150 CSA shares. And, and we were doing that on, you know, less than one acre. And, and these fields were really messy. You know, it was just like they were, they were doing a lot of work. There was a lot of bare soil. There was a lot of weeds. This, it just seemed to be so much more complicated than what we were doing that I, for many years, I wasn't really interested at all into more bigger mechanized system. Not until I saw farms that were really neat and really well, you know, designed and organized a bigger scale that I, that I got more into that later on. When you talk about designing and organizing and you talk about just digging out these beds that one time, um, you know, spending three weeks on, on your initial bed prep there, yep. uh, did you, did you really just lay your farm out once or have you, have you had to go back and change things? <laughs> No, we laid it out once and we had uh, took one winter to really do a good farm design. And, and I was reading a lot of permaculture books back then. Those Bill, big Bill Mollison, big fad book number one, fad book number two. And a lot of, of my ideas were on papers. And we, we did, you know, we subdivided the, the two acre prairie in, in 10 field blocks that was surrounding the warehouse. We bought an old rabbit coop 
So there used to be a building where, <laughs> you know, we didn't have any money. So, you know, that was what we could afford. It was a major upgrade on the TP, I can tell you that. And so the rabbit coop is in the middle of all of our fields and we've subdivided the fields in 10 field blocks. And I had done my research and the 10 field blocks were our rotation plan because we needed to have 10 botanical family in orders to, to get the rotation that we wanted. And so we really, we were thinking a lot about all that. We took the whole winter to design and, and think about strategies to minimize foot circulation, whatever, whatnot. And then came spring and we just kind of laid out the farm. And we were a, a bit lucky because most of these concepts, the importance of them became much clearer later on. But uh, it's just, there was, I, I, I was already, you know, the farms that I had worked on, the rented farm where we were and the farm in New Mexico was such a mess that I was, I was looking for efficiencies early on. One of my, for many years, I had been a tree planter. I don't know if you've heard about people planting trees. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. And you basically get played by the tree, right? And then you, there's always one guy or one girl that in the same exact context, uh, same weather, uh, he just, he's planting double the number of tree that you are. He's just more efficient at it. And so for many years, my mind was kind of brainwashed or I don't know what the word is, but just kind of like trained to look at efficiency. And when it was time to farm, I was, I was looking for ways to make, you know, myself be efficient in what I'm doing and, and design. Was it just a natural evolution to that? Well, and I think it, it's one of those things that that efficiency and especially on a small farm where you're providing so much of the work yourself, that ability to really think about how things are laid out and how you're using your body in very specific ways, I think is just something that can't be underestimated. Yeah, and um, I always give this example like, you know, it's pretty uncommon to have people working on 30 inch bed systems. But if you if you think about it, like we've noticed that on our farm harvesting is half of the work we do on the farm. So almost half of right. the time we're, we're down on a, in a squatting position, picking up, you know, veggies. And so the fact that we can reach to the middle of the bed without hyper extending our back, I think makes a difference into my overall posture and my overall stamina through the year because I have a good posture when I'm harvesting because the bed is not too far away. I don't need to kneel into it or I don't need to, you know, overstretch to have access to the greens when they're like, I don't know, you know, 40 inch further from where I am. So there's a lot of that also that I kind of realized later on. And, you know, I don't know if Elliot, when he was thinking about 30 inch beds, he was, he was into these kind of things, but you know, I just makes a lot of sense for me now. Well, I know I, I had the opportunity to harvest spinach with Elliot once. I mean, this has been 20 years ago, but, you know, he was um, and Elliot's not a big guy. But at that point, he was he was straddling the beds a lot. And even at that 30 inches, it really works well for being able to, I think, make a lot of changes to your position. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't want to always be working from the same stance because that, that gets old for your body. And that I think is what that can cause a lot of problems. So I think being able to switch it up is really important. And that 30 inch bed really does facilitate that. Oh, that's a so you don't, you don't stand in the beds at all. I mean, you wouldn't, you, you would try to keep your feet and your knees out of, out of that bed. Yeah. That's why my pathways are 18 inch and not 12 because 12s are, are, you know, sometimes you'll see that because you really want to have as many beds as possible, especially in greenhouses or in hoop houses. But in yeah. our fields, we we figured out that 18 is just, it's more comfortable and we're not breaking, you know, broccoli heads with our butt. So right. <laughs> and, and it's because we don't want to be stepping in the bed. The whole, the whole idea behind intensifying the production is to have great soil structure so that the root systems even if the crops are really close to one another, they can really shoot down and not compete with one another for nutrients, water, whatever. So in order to, to get that soil structure, you know, we've, we've learned and figured out that the better way to, to achieve that is to just not compact the soil at all. 
And so, and, and you're letting the earthworms do the work for you. So we've, we're rolling on the beds with the, with the rotor tiller, but that's not the same as, you know, walking onto the beds or circulating on the bed or even kneeing on the bed, which after a while, you know, it creates a, a lot of pressure. So we try to stay in the aisles and we reach into the bed to harvest. Have you thought about extending the wheels on your BCS so that you don't even have to drive on the bed? <laughs> A lot of people that came to my farm, they left and say, oh, that's the improvement that, that I'll make. But actually, you know, if you're not compacting the soil, why would you want to kind of fix that problem? And uh, when you start playing around with the width of the wheels, what you're doing is you're kind of messing around with the Italian engineers that have designed the tool, the implements in the back to work at a certain height. And, and if you're on, if you're in a raised bed system and your wheels are in the aisles, so that means that the, the, the implement is higher than it should be from the ground. And, and so if, you know, if you're working with hand tools and you don't have a tractor to shape your beds, per, probably your beds won't be perfect. So you, you won't get a perfect layout when you're working with a harrow or even with a rotor tiller. So we we haven't really messed with that and it's you know it's been working fine whatever and it works yeah yeah okay i i guess <laughs> i i hadn't thought about that that whole angle of attack issue but i guess that's when you when you think about setting something up on a tractor that's that's pretty important with how you do that with the three point hitch you know the top link is you know having that having that rototiller level versus back at 15 degrees really matters and i hadn't really thought about that yep. with the with the bcs but that totally makes well, sense you should have seen the, okay. the eyes of the italian engineer when i i brought that up he's like because you know these these guys at bcs they've been redes you know they they've been doing this for a long time and 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 these machines they're they're really well built and there's a lot of engineering into them and you know that was like you shouldn't mess with that. <laughs> it's all good when it comes out of the shop. <laughs> so anyway. It's a, I guess it's good to know when to leave well enough alone, right? Yeah. Well, you know, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. That's right. Well, which actually leads into something else that I think is interesting um, about your operation is you really, I think a lot of beginning farmers go in and they're like, well, you know, I want to, I'm going to have, you know, two acres of vegetables and I'm going to have a couple hundred chickens and I'm going to have some sheep, you know, and we're going to do, you know, some rabbits on the side and, and you don't do any of that, right? No, nope. you're, you're just vegetables. Yeah. We've, you know, from the get go, Chris, my wife and I, what we wanted to do was derive both of our salaries from our farming operation. And we also wanted to have a quality of life. And so that was core to our mission statement. And every year we sit down and we would revisit that and we would try to make the farm work in that sense. So, you know, making the production in, in, in ways that, you know, it meets our needs, but also, you know, not being overworked or overbooked and, and, and seeing that, you know, we, there was, you know, we've, We've had goats and we've had chickens and we've planted an orchard. And it seems that, you know, when you're caring for, you know, 10 fruit tree, trees, it's the same kind of work that if you're caring for, you know, 50, but it's just, you're adding another level of thing to manage. And, you know, we've thought that already like the 40 vegetables that we're managing was enough. So we've kind of decided at one point that we would just stick to the vegetables and, and that also coincided with my kids getting into, you know, growing and me wanting to spend more time with them. And so we just kind of like decided that, you know, working past five was not something that we wanted anymore. I think it's just so important in creating a, a truly sustainable operation to have some, have those limits that you put on it. Yeah. And I think kids are good at that. They, you know, I know you have kids and yeah. certainly when we're farming, it's just, it's, it's, it's so, you know, it's so overwhelming. It's so like fulfilling if, but to have kids, it just kind of like, you have to stop, you have to take time to focus on s s certain other things. And, you know, my wife and I, we joke a lot that when, when the kids get off the farm, then we'll, then we'll work till 11 <laughs> and midnight because we won't have anything else to do. 
But um, <laughs> that was our reality. And I, I think a lot of young farmers are going to that, that stage. And uh, so th- that's why I've been, I've been working on efficiencies on the farm just to make this possible. I remember being at a workshop with Dan Kaplan back in 1997 in upstate New York. And, and he talked about how at 530 every day, whether things are done or not, he leaves the farm. He's just, that's it. 530 is quitting time. You put down the tools and, and he goes home and like this crowd. And it was a, it was this advanced organic farming workshop. And I think everybody in there had been farming for more than three years, I think was the requirement to go to it. And, and when he said that there was this pause in the room for maybe five seconds of just blank silence. And then everybody broke into applause because <laughs> it was just such a, it was such a foreign concept, but at the same time, something that, that everybody knew they really needed. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I, I've never met Dan Kaplan. I've heard about him in, in good ways, but I can certainly relate to that because one year we've decided to implement that, that way of doing things. And boy, I can tell you, Chris, that really changed our farming big time. And just, just the same as when we had the land constraint really define our operation. And when we've put a time constraint, man, it really forced us to really uh, deepen our commitment to planning and to making sure that we're not wasting time on this and that because we, we, we need to finish at 5 or 5.30. And, and it's funny that that year that we did that, we accomplished more doing less work. And, and at the end of the year, we were like, wow, <laughs> that was simple. <laughs> Let's just well, put and I, a cap on your <laughs> working hours and, and force yourself to not, you know, not go off onto these doing these chores that are not really important or relevant. And it's certainly something I've seen with employees, you know, that the amount of work will expand to fill the available time. I mean, if you, if you tell people we've got all afternoon to harvest tomatoes, it takes all afternoon to harvest tomatoes. And if you say we need to be done in the next two hours, magically you're done in the next two hours. Yeah. It, may, it only makes sense that it would apply to the farmer as well. Yeah. I think that in, in the first years, you know, when we were setting up the farm, building the greenhouses, doing all this extra like infrastructure work, that really wasn't an option because there was a lot of work, you know, there's a lot of things to put in motion. But I think it was in our fourth year that we did that. And that's something that, you know, we've been, that's been dear to us now, just to try and keep the work days from a, we, you know, we start at eight and we stop at five and that's it. And so if that was in your fourth year, I mean, you've been, you've been farming for yourselves now for 10 years, 12? Uh, the, since 2002. So that was 13. Thirteen. So that's not a, it's not a flash in the pan, um, management technique. This is something that really works and has proven out over the long haul. Well, yeah. And, and the other thing is that we've kept the, the farm small. So, you know, in many ways at at certain point, I think there's, there's an evolution with, with farmers is that when they reach a certain, you know, goal or plateau, they expand or they develop new markets or they build a new warehouse and, or they, you know, but we haven't done any of that. We've just kept the farm to what it is. And we've been just looking at ways to, to optimize what we've had and, and try to grow from the inside, like I told before. And yeah. And so we've haven't committed to something big, which would require us to invest a lot of our time to something, you know, like, like finding 200 new clients or, you know, getting a, building a warehouse or we've kept things simple. And, and to be honest, one of the reasons why we've done that is that, you know, our bottom line has been pretty good. And, and I'm not sure that after all these investments and after all the, the years, you know, working to have a return on the investments, I'm, we weren't even sure if we would be making more money you know, down the road than, 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 than what we were now. So we, that was another reason why we wanted to, to keep this, the farm pretty small. So do you mind if I ask you about, about some money questions? <laughs> no, I think it's, I'm, I'm kind of open. I, I have to say though, you know, we have, we have in Quebec a 50% income tax. And so there's a lot of advantage in not talking too much about. <laughs> so what, well, I'm, we, we make about yeah. margins that are around 50% of our sales on the farm. Okay. And uh, okay. the sales last year were 155. 
thousand dollars. And that's Canadian. 155 Canadian dollars. Yeah. 155,000 Canadian dollars. Yep. Right. Okay. Okay. So once we- Wow. So, that, I mean, that's, that's a decent salary. Well, I, that's yeah, nothing I to, so. nothing to sneer at. And, and are you being able to, to think about the future with that too? Are you guys being able to sock money away into retirement and, and savings and health insurance and all that other stuff that you need to take care of? Well, you know, we have a pretty frugal life and I guess most of us farmers, that's pretty much what aligns us. But from the start, we've always put 20% of our earnings aside. And so our earnings have been going up slow over the years, but we've always put 20% aside. That's great. Yeah. And I think that's the way to do it because if you, and we did that at the beginning of the year, we would do two things, Chris, we would pay ourselves first and then we would put some of it aside. And the first few years, we would uh, end the year in, 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 in the red, meaning, you know, we were at minus 10,000. And so I would work with, you know, I don't know if you guys get that, those credit cards, they offer you 0% for six months. Yep. We get a lot of these. And so I would, I would do that for six months and then I would get another credit card. And then, you know, the, the first year we were at minus 12 and then we went to minus eight and then minus six. And then, and then we went to zero and then it's been going positively ever since, but we've always, when we did the yearly budget at the start of the season, when we do our farm planning and, and we would always take some of the chunk and put it into our personal bank accounts because we wanted to make sure that we were committing to ourselves first. I really think that's so important. Um, you know, that, and I think it's really easy and I mean, this, this goes back to the hours thing too, that you, you know, the number of hours that you're working is that whole idea of like, what comes first? Is it the farm or is it you, mm-hmm. you know, is it the farm or is it the kids? Is it the farm or is it your relationship? And I think, Ooh. I think farms and maybe small businesses in general have a tendency to, uh, they, they are, they're, well, they're kind of like two-year-olds. They, they're very loud and very insistent about their, about what they need and what they want from you. Um, and like two year olds, a lot of what they think they need from you is not necessarily what they actually need from you. you know? And and if you don't set some limits, you're going to be, you're going to be a slave to the two year old. And I, I love your analogy. I think you're so right on. Oh. How old are your kids, JM? Uh, 11 and six. And so we, we've got, our, we had our little boy when I was 25, really didn't know what we were getting into. But it's been, it's been okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, nobody tells you what, what it, exactly what to expect with farms or kids. Right. Yeah. Oh. So one of the things that, that you talked about um, in the book was prioritizing the profitable crops on the farm. Mm-hmm. And I'm really interested in, in taking a look at that because you st- you're still doing a CSA, right? Yeah. And you do a farmer's market. Yep. We do two. Two farmer's markets and, and then restaurant sales as well. Yeah. We do for the restaurant. It's, it's mostly, it's just, it's just mescaline salad mix that we do for them. Okay. Cause they, they call and, us up and they, you know, we talk to them for like 40 minutes and then it's a $50 order. And it's just like, forget <laughs> that. I'm just going to bring you 10 pounds of salad mix every week and I'll drop it by your door and that's it. And I'll send you an invoice every month. Those standing orders are so much better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, if you've got the CSA, how are you, how are you prioritizing the profitable crops on the farm? Because I think that's one of the real challenges that people have on vegetable operations is this, this demand to grow everything. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're growing a lot of stuff. You know, there's only quite just a few that we don't grow. Like we don't grow potatoes. We don't grow winter squash. We don't grow rutabagas. Actually, we don't grow all the storage crops that need to be harvested with machines to be efficient. And then you need a front end loader to move the bins around and you need a big warehouse, all of which we didn't want to acquire because, you know, we just thought, you know, it's just a lot of money to, to lay out. And uh, because our operation starts stops in November. So when the last CSA stops in November, we're off. We're off till next June, basically. And we have, we have salad mix that we grow further out for the restaurants till Christmas. And then we have later on in March, but so some of the, you know, the potatoes we buy from Fred, 
our neighbor. He's, he has an organic, organic certified farm and our customers know about this. So winter squash, there's another big grower. Well, I, I, I shouldn't say big grower, but. <laughs> uh, well, I think everybody's big relative yeah. to you, JM. <laughs> yeah. You know, a more, you know, the, the bigger farm, uh, he has squash. So we buy it. We, and, and the price we pay for this, Chris, is just like, wow, $30 for a 50 pound bags of potatoes. I can't grow potatoes at, and compete with that. It's just, I can't, I, I'll be, I'll be harvesting them with a pitchfork. And, and brushing each potatoes with a, with, a, with a brush. And then when I go to farmer's market, I can't say that mine are more artisanal or, you know, more something than my neighbors, a potatoes a potato. So we've really focused on, on the other ones, mostly greens, mostly uh, uh, roots that we can sell with their tops on. And so that we, you know, people understand that it's fresh that way. And, it's, it's harder to clean a bunch of carrot than it is to, you know, leave out the, the, the stems and just put them in a root washer. So we've, we've focused with, with these crops in mind. Crops where you're able to add value with your labor. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we're not doing some of the other ones. Like we're still bro- growing broccolis and cabbage and, and cauliflowers. But, you know, given our land constraint, we've had to make choice. And so at farmer's market, we'll have a lot more, you know, cherry tomatoes than we'll have broccolis. And luckily for us, because we make a lot more money with cherry tomatoes than with broccolis. You mentioned the importance of record keeping. And I think this is something that everybody, everybody who's farming on a small scale comes back to. You've got to, you've got to keep good records. You've got to know what you're doing and when you're doing it and, and what worked and didn't work. Um, can you talk about your system that you use for that? Well, um, I can say, I, I know people are, that have met my book, book don't, don't believe that, but we're not super good at record keeping actually, <laughs> because okay. record keeping for me means that every day you're, sit, you're writing something up, you know, you are re- really registering something. And I think that for us, our, our, our force or where we, we've achieved more success was really the forethought and the planning before. So we do a lot of work in the planning stage. We try to lay out the season in as much detail as possible with our crop planning calendar. And, and we really try to visualize what's going to happen and we write down everything. And, and then we just go with that. And if something goes wrong, then we're going to take note of that and put that in our calendar. And then the next time around, we'll have notes about, oh no, we've planted the carrots way too late and they were too small when it was time to harvest these kind of things. But on a daily, on a daily, uh, we, we just don't, I mean, we just don't take the time to know what's happening and perhaps we should, but. No, oh, I think that's, but I guess, I mean, if you have the plan and what you focus on is, is recording when things don't go to plan, I mean, in a, in a way you've got the record keeping there because if you're, if you're diligent about getting things written down when it's not going the way the plan says, then, then essentially the plan is the record at that point. Yeah. So, and, and, and mostly that's how it works. And, and, you know, I like planning and I like when the plan works. So when it doesn't, it just really annoys me. So I, I do take the time to write it up because I'm like, Oh, I was supposed to, you know, do my carrots in pre-emergence and I forgot that I need to prepare my beds 10 days before it wasn't in the calendar. And so I, I'll take definitely the time to, to write it up because it doesn't go according to how it should. And that really bothers me when that happens. So when you talk about, about really planning and in, you didn't use the word excruciating, but I'm going to planning and excruciating detail, what happens over the course of the year, are you including things like we need to, you know, we need to till this bed on this day and we're going to broad fork this bed, but not broad fork that bed. And I need to be flame weeding here if I've seeded on this date? Well, basically in a nutshell, what we do is we have, we, we project what we're going to sell every week. And once we do this, farmer's market, CSA and, and we can calculate the farmer's market clients. Like if it was a CSA box, Okay, because they pretty much buy the same kind of thing anyway. 
So we we kind of decide that in the winter. And then once we've decided every week what the offer will be, we go in our calendar and then we determine when do we need to plant this to make it happen at that time and how many beds we need to plant to have enough supply for our 200 clients. And so we do that, we get, we get, and then, and then we figure out, okay, if it's, if it's uh, started in the greenhouse, when does it need to be transplanted so that it goes out into the field? And then w- once we have all this information, we put it in the calendar which tells us in a week's glance what needs to be transplanted, what needs to be direct seeded. And from there, I know that if I need to stale seed bed my carrots, I'll go and go 10 day prior to that planting date and I'll write a note saying, prepare seed bed for carrots. And that's pretty much how we go about it. And then we also, if we know that we have, you know, certain certain bugs that are problematic at a certain time, we'll make, we'll put notes, you know, cover carrots in August or whatever. So the calendar becomes this kind of tool that, that is a reminder of everything that needs to happen when things go right or, or wrong. You know, I'm a big proponent of planning. And one of the things I oftentimes hear when I'm talking to beginning farmers and, and even some experienced farmers about, about putting, putting the time and the intention into creating the plan is that, you know, well, things aren't going to go according to plan anyways. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to rain when we thought it was going to be sunny. Uh, the, you know, that, that field's going to lay wet when we hoped it was going to lay dry. Um, how are you dealing with those kinds of variances? Well, first of all, you know, my, my father would always tell me a goal without a plan is just a wish. And so if you're not planning ahead, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't even understand, Chris, how people can work, you know, a a diversified organic farm without having at least a work, a weekly workload plan laid out because there's so many variables. How can you remember everything? How can you do everything diligently? But, you know, obviously nothing goes exactly according to plan, but, you know, it won't be super off. Also, so if I'm, you know, if I'm planning to have radishes on the second week of June, well, I won't have them in July. Right. You know, because I'll just, if anything, I'll work the conditions to make this happen. If it's, if there's a drought, I'll water. If it's too cold, I'll put a row cover, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm working my gardens to make it efficient everywhere and to, you know, to, to try to minimize the disturbance which is not always easy, but you know, I, I it just it just is good enough so that the flow of the plan works out at the end of the year, and at least it gives us something to chew on, something to plan for. You know, like on Sunday night, we have a pretty good idea of everything that needs to be done during that week. Plus, we have our observations on the farm that, that we do daily. So. With those two in mind, you know, we're able to manage things pretty nicely. And if there's a, if there's too much weed pressure, we can, we, we, we can try and, and make time for that, considering that we also have this and that to transplant or these seedlings to start. If it's rainy at the beginning of the year, of the week, we can, we can do our transplanting there. And, and you know, I think we, you need to know all of this at least a, a week ahead. Otherwise it's, whew, <laughs> it's yeah. I, I've never understood how people do it. Um, you know, I mean, for me that I, I fall back on, I fall back on planning all the time. Uh, you know, whenever I'm feeling overwhelmed, I step back and make a plan. Yeah. You know, it's what I do, but there's other people that I think feel a lot more comfortable diving in. So I think, always think it's interesting just to flesh that out a bit. Are you guys, uh, then on, like on Sunday night, you guys sit down and have a meeting about what needs to be done for the week? No, not on Sunday night. Okay. Not, not anymore. Um, I, Sunday night, we're probably eating pizza and, and, and drinking wine, but, um, Monday morning, we definitely will do that. But, you know, I, you know, I have to say, you know, we've, you know, the farm is, the plant is pretty good. We're just kind of refining it every, every year. So it's not like we kind of have this notion that, you know, we'll wake up tomorrow and it's pretty clear what's going to happen. And that's really a nice, I mean, it's a nice comforting place to be, I think, to know what to expect. Yeah. And, 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 and not to say, you know, I don't want people to think that what we're doing is perfect and it's certainly not. 
Um, but I, I really think that planning part of what, you know, what we're doing and the fact that really allows us to have two or three crops per year per bed is really because we know in advance when one thing is going to be harvested and by what is it going to be replaced with. And this is all in the, in the calendar. So when, you know, as soon as the radishes are harvested, then the lettuces go in and they've been started four weeks earlier because we knew this ahead of time because we always plan to not only the harvest date, the, the planting date, but also the harvest dates. And we give, you know, a week or two of leeway for if there's uncertainty or if there's temperatures that make this, uh, you know, uh, not as, as it would be in the optimal way. So there's, there's all the, there's a map of the farm with all the beds and we know all the successions of every bed on all the field blocks. And that integrates also the green manures or the cover crops, they call them. And so we're, so you, you're giving those the same priority that you're giving to the crops, to the cash crops. Yeah. Well, we've, we've just, uh, just like in our rotation, we've, we've put the, the cover crop into the design of the farm. And so it's in cover crop about a third of the year, always on every bed, but it just moves around. So we basically we're big planners, but just in the winter, because in the summer, we don't really plan anything anymore. We just follow what the plan is, which I think is, is a good strategy because in the summer, there's so much to do. There's fires everywhere. And, and in the winter, we, you know, we have nothing to do. We go skiing and it's just like, it's, 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 uh, it's 30 below zero uh, Celsius. So it's really, anyway, I don't know in Fahrenheit, but that's, I can tell you that's really cold. So yeah. we're, we're, we're taking the feel heat from the summer and we're bringing it down in the winter, trying to plan as much as we can in detail. It's interesting. Ben Hartman, uh, the author of the lean farm talked in a couple episodes ago about, about trying to level out the workload over the, over the year, you know, and so they've actually picked up more winter work and, and skimped down on the summer work. And it's interesting that it sounds like part of what you're doing with the planning process is to, rather than shifting production to the winter, you're, you're shifting a certain portion of the work to the winter, yeah. you know, which is that, that planning and that, that forecasting and projecting piece. I don't know if there's a part of in, in, in your, in your podcast where you ask your, your speaker what their favorite new book is, but Ben Hartman's book is whew, the, the lean farm. That was, that was one of the best book I've read in a long time. Really like his book. I loved it. And, and, um, so <laughs> there, there isn't, but you just answered that question. So we're good to go on that. Um, the, I, yeah, it really was. And, and for me, I mean, even, even here in my, in my, my podcast studio slash office, I mean, I'm, I've been trying to put some of those principles to work because they're so, I think they're so profound and you can just, when you read, when you read the book, you can look at it and you can see, you can look at it and go, Oh yeah, that's stuff that just makes sense. You know, and I can figure out how to apply that in my own situation. Yeah. And I, I really like the fact that we can apply you know, some industrial kind of like concepts of management and, and, and design and organizations to something like a small farm and, and, and with good results. And, and basically that's pretty much what we've been doing in our farm. And it's just neat and fun to, to have other people echo this way of doing, because, because, you know, you know, this, Chris, when you talk about farming, you know, less than two acre, a lot of, a lot of growers don't, don't take that very seriously. They're like, oh, this is just like small farming. But, you know, actually, we're, we're deriving two income from this farm. We've been doing this for more than a decade. And, you know, it's just it's just a different scale. Yeah. I mean, that's what we were on my farm. That's what we were doing for 20 acres. You know, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, it is. I think I think a lot of times measuring looking at that net, looking at that bottom line and asking, you know, what, what are we really getting out of what we're doing? Cause I know there's a lot of people farming 20 acres who aren't making two incomes out of that and certainly not two good incomes out of it. So the fact that you're doing that at your scale, it, I mean, inherently says this has to be taken seriously. Do you think that how much of that do you think comes from your, your geographic location? Do you feel like this is something that's replicable anywhere or is this specific to how close you are to Montreal or, um, you know, specific to the fact that you're farming in Canada or, or anything like that? I think that we we're farming the worst place possible because we don't have any, you know, our winters are so harsh. 
our seasons are small. And, you know, we don't have, you know, in, in Quebec, especially, we don't, we have a lot of good growers in Quebec, but we definitely don't have markets like you would have in the U.S. And, and the prices are really not the same. Like, actually, I'm, you know, I would consider driving five hours to go to New York to sell my salad mix, 16 pounds, $16 a pound and, and make twice more money per year, not doing more work. And that would be, wow. But so and, and so to answer your question, I, I don't think, you know, s- some of the success, if we can say that out of our farm is is specific to the location. It's really applying, you know, certain design principles, certain management techniques and just, you know, trying to work on the bottom line. And so we have about 250 clients overall. And um, yeah, we have a super short season. Perhaps that kicks us in the rear to really get a lot of things going because we need to make the money you know, in a short period of time. And perhaps the winter break is good because it does allow us to stop and rest and, and reflect on the new season. Uh, I know I, I, I'm just coming back from, from France and most of the growers in, in where I was, they were doing 50 weeks CSA. And, you know, so I was asking them, so when do you get the time to recharge your battery, do something else in farming? And when do you take the time to really plan out your season? And the answer was, well, we don't. We don't have the time for that. It's what I found when we went to doing four seasons of production. Um, it made the planning difficult and it always felt like a little bit of a rear guard action rather than something that we were that we were really putting the level of intention into that, that we would have benefited from. We're going to take a break here to get a word from our sponsors. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by the Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. What if you didn't have to worry about weak transplants and poor germination due to less than great potting soil or getting truly finished compost for your homemade blend or making sure that your employees remember to add the fertilizer charge? Oh, been there, done that. What if you could grow plants up until the roots filled the container without having to worry about supplying extra fertility? What if your potting soil had your back consistently? year after year. That's what Vermont Compost Potting Soil can bring to you. Vermont Compost Fall Pre-Buy Program going on now through December 21st can ensure that you enjoy the guaranteed best price, the best shipping options, and receive your soil at a time that works best for you. Plus, their shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that get shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need. With PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, and you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheeled farm tractors. I've used other tillers and mowers and spent most of the time thinking about how much easier it would be with a BCS. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. And even though we owned a four-wheeled tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled important jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments. And now back to the Farmer to Farmer podcast with JM Fortier. I mean, you talked about double and triple cropping some beds. Um, now, if your soils are anything like the soils in Vermont, you, I mean, it's not like you've got this Iowa topsoil there that where you can just keep on planting and planting and planting. What are you doing for a fertility system? Well, we've we've really built our soil up and, and there's two, two, two ways about that. We've, when we started, we had a, a pretty nice loam. It was, it was a loamy soil, a bit rocky, but you know, good enough. And, but we've been adding a lot of compost and organic matter through a year to the farm. And, you know, we're never turning the soil upside down. So we're, we have, it's not a no-till system because we do surface cultivation but we use, all our tilling is done with a broad fork, which really doesn't invert the layers or disturb the soil. And so we've been kind of just like building up organic matter in the soil. And now our soils are like 10, 12 percent organic matter content. And oh, yeah. And we figured that out 
three years ago because the first few years we we're doing a lot of soil sampling and analysis and then we were trying to get things right so we were basically our fertility plan was to do compost and chicken manure together working you know working with uh, quick nitrogen release at the start of, of the of the growing uh, cycle for the crops and then you know, their roots going down and taking the compost and the organic matter in the compost building up the soil. That was our fertility strategy for many years. And then when we looked at the organic matter going up, we said, well, I don't think we need to be putting that much organic matter anymore. And so now we're using a lot of vermicompost and we've cut down on putting, we were, we were putting about, you know, 60 ton per acre of compost onto these beds which was like 10 wheelbarrows per hundred foot beds, a lot of compost. That's a lot of compost. Yeah, and, and, and we, we buy our compost and it was delivered hot in the spring. And it was, it was such a small fraction. It is, well, we don't do it anymore like that, but it was such a small fraction of our revenue that we thought, why, why not just put a lot of it and try to build the soil and make it really fertile. And now we've really cut that on that strategy. And now we're using vermicompost. And uh, this is the second year we're doing it that way. And we're doing ramel wood chips into our aisles. I don't know if you've ever heard about that. Yeah, we was just talking to Carl Hammer about this uh, from Vermont Compost. Uh, these, you know, small, basically ground up small sticks, right? Yeah, it's, it's the bottom of the, of the hardwood uh, branches that you take, the, the, you know, you take down in the spring when all the energy of the tree goes there, and then you you cut them into pieces, you you, you chip them, and and you let them you let them like digest for a full year in your path, and then you shoot them onto your bed. When we re raise our beds, now we shoot it onto the bed, and that brings a lot of carbon to the soil. And so we're, we're now thinking, you know, because we have, you know, we have, we don't have the, the enough experience to, to really know if that's a super positive thing. I think it is, but we're, we're building organic matter differently now without, you know, two things. We're putting organic matter and fertility separately, which before we would do together. So you're putting the wood chips down in your 18 inch pads. Yeah. This, this, and, and are they, are they already rotted before you're putting them down nope, in the, on the pads? No. They're okay. fresh, they're full of enzymes, and that's where all the microorganisms, they, they jump on it and they, they chew it, they, they try to digest it, they break it down. Because if you put it right onto your bed, what happens is that all the microorganisms, they're, they're busy you know, trying to decompose the, the ramel wood chip, and then nitrogen will not be available. So most, if you do this, you'll see your crops, they're just not as healthy as they would. So we try to break it down for one full season. And, and since our beds are raised, the, the pathways are in a depression. So it's always, you know, more moist. And so that really speeds up also the decomposition. And so we've, we've seen that in, in, in systems in Europe. And, and actually, Ramel Woodchip was developed in Quebec like 30 years ago. And more and more now, I'm trying to educate myself on trying to make use of our alleyways. And, and by putting organic matter into the alleyways and, and, and doing the composting stage there. And then you said you're shooting that into the beds. So is that with, a, with one of these rotary plows? Yeah, the rotary plow came into our tool shed, I think, six years ago. It's mounted on the BCS and it's, it's, it just scoops the dirt from the aisle and shoots it onto the bed, like you said. And that's how we raise our beds now. And, you know, it's just a lot faster than the shovels, obviously, but that's how also we incorporate our cover crops because for many years, like I told you, we don't use the rotor tiller on the farm. We were always wondering about cover crops. It was like, okay, if it's a green manure, then you need to incorporate into your soil. But when I'm doing that, I'm, you know, I'm destroying the integrity of my soil. I'm overhauling everything. And so we were kind of like in a jam there. And eventually we just kind of like figured out, well, I just, I'll just mow the cover crop with my flail mower, shred it into pieces, lay it on the bed. And then I'll, I'll use the dirt from the aisle and kind of bury the cover crop that way. Okay. And so, Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. And, and that's how, that's our approach to a, 
I, you know, I'm always hesitant to say no-till because I don't want people to think that, you know, but to go into a no-till system and, and, and have cover crops or green manures like incorporated into the system. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah, I think, it, you know, it's, it's minimizing that, minimizing that tillage as much as possible. And that no-till system, I think is so hard, especially if you're in the North. I mean, I think that might work. Now you look at where like Rodale is even down in Southern Pennsylvania, where they've done all the work on, on no-till soybeans. That's a completely different story than being up on the, up on the 45th latitude. Yeah. I, I have personally a strong inclination for that. I'm doing a lot of experimenting here trying to figure out ways uh, to do this. And, and for me, there's a lot of biological reason why, you know, I'm, I'm really big with earthworms. And for the last five years, six years, I've been really wanting to replace mechanical tillage with, with biological tillage and, and trying to see, could the earthworm do the job for me? And, and I'm really serious about this. And I'm trying to figure out ways to eliminate steps. And so if I don't need to till, and if I can figure out ways to prepare my seed beds without tilling and without being at more, more work, less work would be better. That's really what I want to do. And I, I don't know if reading the book, you've, you've, you've came across the fact that we're using a lot of plastic tarps. Yes. I actually wanted to ask you about that. Um, but, but go ahead. Well, that, you know, plastic tarp was one of the the first way we found to prepare seed beds without working them. And, and, you know, it's, we've, we started working with them because I was, I was covering some certain beds in my hoop houses in, in the spring because I, I, they weren't ready to be planted to be planted. And I, I didn't want to get them infested with weeds. So we had these long tarps and we just cover the soil until it's ready. And then I, I noticed that, you know, the beds that had been tarped had a lot lead, less weed pressure than, than the beds that hadn't. And the explanation is pretty simple. When you tarp your soil, you're creating conditions where it's moist, it's warm, and it's dark. So all the dormant weed seeds that are buried, they germinate. Because this is the, you know, it's the good condition for that. And then what happens is that they die off because there's no light. So, so that's called occultation. And m many of the French growers that I visit, that's how they clean their fields. And so we were really excited about that. So I bought some big ass tarps and, and tried to cover whole field blocks in one thing leading to the other. When I, I was opening these, these tarps, then, you know, the fields were clean. All the crop residues were not there anymore. All the weeds had disappeared. And my bed. So you're just, so when you, like when you harvest, when you harvest a crop of broccoli, you're just, are you just taking this tarp and spreading it over those well, beds a, a broccoli i will mow it first with the flail mower to shred okay. it into pieces and then i'll cover it with a tarp and I'll, I'll leave the tarp there for two or three weeks and when i'll remove the tarp perhaps the stem of the broccoli won't be fully de decomposed but with a rake i'll just rapidly go and but all the rest all the all the weed seeds all, all the weeds all, all anything else that had been interfering is, is disappeared. Wow. That's amazing. That's, I mean, I'm going to get tarps for my garden. <laughs> well, you that know, just sounds it's, it's just, it works. And, and if you have your beds already shaped because you're in a permanent bed setup, well, then you have nothing else to do than to simply plant into them. You can add compost and then you plant into them. And so you're not working the soil at all. So like if you were coming I mean, let's just say out of broccoli and going to plant some beets, you would, you would tarp it. You would pull those, those stems off. And then well, you, I guess you tarp it, you'd untarp it. You'd pull the stems, pull the stems out. And then you're just going in there with the seeding. You're not even loosening the soil at all. Well, it depends what's going afterwards. If okay. in my, in my, you know, cropping system, what I want to do is if there's uh, crops that have deep rooting systems, I want to go with a broad fork just to make sure that the soil is really loose. Or if I have a lot of interns, I'll use a broad fork. <laughs> yeah. But you know, broad forking is always good. You can't overdo it as long as you're not inverting the layers with the broad fork. And so I'll do that. And then if I'm direct seeding, I'll go with my harrow, which really neatly prepares the soil. But if I'm transplanting, that's it. Boom, I go. So 
by tarping the soil, what we've done is that we've eliminated, you know, we're eliminating a lot of the dormant wheat seeds because, the, you know, because of what I've described earlier. We're preparing the soil without working it. And it's just we're taking, we're, we're taking some steps not, you know, not to do the work. So the, the, actually the elements are doing the work for us. And the earthworms, because this is not a joke, if you look at earthworms and, and their habitat and their habits, they work when it's dark and it's moist and when they have organic matter to feed on. So when you tarp, you're kind of like tricking them, thinking it's nighttime. And so they're working 24-7, you know, making canals in your soil and taking the organic matter from the crop residue, bringing it down to your soil. And, and they're, they're creating the soil profile. They're structuring your soil. And so that's, so, that's really what I'm into now. I, I want to try and see if I can harness that power to have less work, less of a burden on myself. So basically, JM, you're, you're pulling a nine hour work day and you're just making everything else on your farm work 24 seven. Well, <laughs> that's, that's my, my ideal way, but I think, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, I think all of us as, as, as organic growers, we should, we should be paying more attention to, to the ecosystem of, of the soil and, and earthworms are, you know, they could be allies. I think it's really, it's interesting because in the organic community, there tends to be such an aversion to plastic, uh, you know, whether it's being used in a, you know, in a single use fashion, like laying out black plastic on the soil and planting through it, or whether it's, well, any, really any use of it at all, putting greens in bags. I've had people get upset that we were using the wrong kind of plastic for that. And it's interesting here that you you're really incorporating that as a, as a real part of your system, but one that actually has some additional benefits to it. Yeah. And, and, it, and these, these tarps are, they're silage tarps or they're UV treated. They're eight mil. You know, I've had them for 10 years now. They're not going away any, anytime soon. And it's just like these people that are, you know, bothered about plastic, you know, they, they, they buy these Nalgene's water bottles. They're made out of plastic. You know, everything's made out of plastic. <laughs> it's just. Well, and I, I ripped a line off from somebody and I forget who I've heard it from a couple of different sources, but this idea that you can be a nudist or you can be a Buddhist, but you can't be a nudist Buddhist. <laughs> and, and I've always kind of looked at that as a way to say, you know, you're, you're an organic already an organic vegetable farmer, right? You're trying to grow vegetables. Yeah. You're doing it in a place that's not California. Um, you're, you're trying to do it organically. You're already a little bit crazy, you know? So, you know, trying to go completely over the top with things, a lot of times it's just going to shoot you in the foot. Yeah, I totally you agree know? with that. And I, I'm a strong advocate of substitutions. Once you get your system going and, and you're making a profit and, and you're balancing your workload with your life, now is a good time to make a change. You know, if you, if you don't want to use plastic, well, wait in year seven <laughs> to change right. it with something once, once you know what you're doing. But if you're starting off with all these principles, man, it's just like, you know, some people now, they want to go, they want to do no-till right off the bat. They, in their mind, tilling is bad. And so that's a big hurdle because even experienced veteran growers are still trying to figure out how to do this. And it's hard and complex. So better off to start, you know, in more conventional ways. And then you improve your system as you go along. At least that's how we've done it. And well, yeah, I think that's, that's a more gentle slope to, to, uh, to mount, you know? Well, and I think it ultimately it increases the likelihood that you're going to succeed and, you know, if you, I mean, if you really want to do the world a favor and you're getting started in organic vegetable farming, stay in organic vegetable farming, you know, set up a system that's going to let you have a business 20 years from now. Yeah. And if you, you know, if your business fails because you refuse to, because you refuse to till or because you refuse to have, uh, you know, any sort of a gas implement on your farm or, or you name it, I think you're, you're setting yourself up for not being there in the long run. And ultimately that's, that's less good for for the environment, for the economy, for the sociology, yeah. than 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 finding a way to stick around. Yeah, there, um, I would also put another kind of category people in in the category. There's a lot of people that are they've 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 gone the road of of you know developing their farms to be you know much much broader and much I I don't like to say the word bigger but much 
And, and for them also, there's like a prejudice to not look at what small, really small scale farmers are doing. And sometimes, you know, innovation, doing innovation on one acre is not the same thing on 20 acres. And so I think there's a lot of cool things that can come out of how, you know, micro farms are setting up and, and look at, at their systems and, and trying to see what works there and perhaps scale this concept or this idea up. Yeah. And I think the the converse is true too. You know, that, that being able to, being able to learn from the, learn from the larger scales. And we even, you referred to it earlier, you know, being able to take the concepts out of lean, which was developed in a factory setting and saying, how do we take something like that and apply it to the farm? That's really cool when you can, when you can pull that, that energy and that information from something that only seems distantly related to what you're doing. Yeah. And, oh yeah. And, and I can tell you, Chris, now, I'm visiting the farms that I'm visiting most now. They're they're conventional farms here in Quebec. We where we have a lot of big conventional farms and vegetable farms, and, and you know I visit how they how they have their you know washing station and how they process things and and it's just there's a lot to learn from big farms also definitely. This has been great. I really appreciate this, Jam. This is this has been fantastic, and I just feel like I feel like there's been a lot of nice. I don't know, little, little additions that I didn't, the things that I didn't get out of, out of reading the book. I really appreciate your, your taking the time, but we're going to turn now to the lightning round Ooh. here and <laughs> we are going to get you some, some quick questions here along the lines of, you know, what's your favorite farming book lately, but we'll, we'll start with what's your favorite tool on the farm? Well, I, I have to say it's the broad fork. <laughs> that, that was easy. Yeah. That's the name of my so. farm in French. And, and I know the broad fork gets sometimes a hard rep, but Man, I tell you, Chris, if, if if I could find a tool that does the work that it does such a gentle way on a bigger scale or for, you know, on, on something mechanized, I, I haven't I haven't yet seen that tool. So tell me how you use the broad fork in your operation. I mean, you know, and I, I'm interested both in where it fits in in your tillage process, but also just physically and how to use a broad fork, because I've. I've certainly used one before and and I actually own two of them because I broke one and had it repaired in the meantime. When you say you're getting down a hundred foot bed in 30 minutes, I'm, I'm going either you're either you're a lot more vigorous than I am or, or I'm doing something wrong. Well, you should see it's because when we plant the broad fork into our soil, it's just like goes in because we haven't been turning the soil upside down for all, for almost 10 years. So the soil is really well structured and and there's a lot of aggregates and it's just, it's a loose soil. And so broad forking now is not like it used to be when I started where it was really more of a challenge, but that's the thing. If when you're broad forking, Chris, it's a challenge, then you should be broad forking because that's the whole thing. (laughs) And, 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 you know, what I see and what I like about broad fork is that it allows you to penetrate the soil, bring air into the soil open up the soil, but without disturbing any of the ecosystem or, you know, the canals that were dig, it's just, it's a gentle <laughs> tool, but it really does the work of, of what deep tillage does. So when you're sticking that into, so you stick the tines into yep. the soil and, mm-hmm. and you got the hand and, and again, the broad fork, we probably should have said this earlier, but the broad fork is, it's got a bunch of tines, like a digging fork on it, but then it's, Yours is probably 30 inches wide and then has has a handle on either side yep. that's sticking up into the air. So you you stick that into the soil and you step back and you pull it back. How far back not, are not, you pulling it? Not a lot of, you know, not far, like perhaps six inch a foot. I'm just I'm just kind of rowing backward and okay. I'm, I'm, I do the process again and then I go. And sometimes I do it with a fast pace because I just like to do it like that. But, if, you know, you could do it at your own pace. But you know, it's not about overdoing it. And again, it comes back to not having too many steps. Like if you're pushing back and forth and back and forth, well, it's twice the amount of time as if you're just pulling back, you know, pulling back, okay. planting, pulling back, planting, pulling back. So you, you'll see some of my interns, they come in there, planting, pulling back, going front, pulling back. And they're just like kind of like playing with it, but it's just, no, you plant it, you pull back, you pull out, you plant. And then you, you just get into a rowing motion. I think, I think maybe I was being too aggressive with it and too wanting it to come all the way back to the ground. Cause I tend to be that kind of a guy. Um, I, so just, I so also, it's just six I, inches. Yeah. I also like the, the, the flame weeder. I think the flame weeder is just a, such a great tool. 
<laughs> you, do you have one of them where you get to carry the propane tank around on your back? Yeah. Yeah. The guys yeah. from flame, flameweeder.com do that. And they've asked me not to talk about it because they're back order for like two seasons. <laughs> but it's just like, man, we've, we, we, our carrots bed, they're weed free. We, we've, we don't pull any weeds from our carrot beds anymore because we've, we've worked it out with the flame weeder where we're, we're flaming the weeds just before the carrots are ready to emerge from the soil. And that provides us with weed-free beds of carrots. And it's been saving us tons of hours of, of, thing, of, of, of weeding every year. And is that the flame weeder that you're using then, is that one of these that covers the whole bed or are you yeah. doing one row at a time? No, no. I think you can do one row at a time because you need to make sure that even if it's windy or if it's raining, that you have enough BTU to really burn the, you know, the weeds out. And so ours is 30 inch. It has five torches and it's, it's in a box. It's contained. So even if it's windy, the flames won't be, uh, won't be bothered by it. Okay. And how do you know when you're going to flame weed those carrots? Well, when we, when I plant the carrots, I always plant, put a, a, a bunch of beet seeds at the, st- at the start of the bed. And so when I see some, you know, purple leaves starting to germinate, I know that the carrots will be popping up in the next two days because under the same conditions, you know, beets will always germinate before carrots. And when I do beets, I put, uh, 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 I put some radishes down at the start of the bed. We actually used to do, um, we used to seed pelleted carrot seeds with a belt seeder. And I would, I would go searching for beet seeds that were exactly the same size as the pelleted carrot seeds and, and mix those in for that same reason. So I know a lot of people, they use in glass or, but you know, I think for me, I just like a handful of beet seeds. I'm sure that I'll see it. And I also, I put it in my calendar. So (laughs) that's how I remember to plant the beets. Yeah. And actually Chris, now I put it in my iPhone iPhones are changing everything because you can put your, you could put some alarms. Cause that's really wonderful. I put alarms for so many things now. So tell me how you would put an alarm in for remembering to plant your beets uh, along with your carrots. No, I'm, I, I would, I would put my alarm to say that in eight days, I need not to forget to come and check. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I actually did that for a long time with a I used to carry a Palm Pilot back in like 2002 um and you know used to do the same thing with that. It was something I ended up moving away from uh even when we got into the into the smartphone era. That one did that one didn't work for me. But I can see where it would for somebody who was who was a little bit more in tune with that. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Um uh, what's your favorite crop to grow? Uh Salamix mesclun seems that I've been enjoying my relationship with that crop so close to me now <laughs> for so long. So many people hate growing mescaline. What, what are you doing that makes you love it? Well, first of all, I, I eat so much of it. And <laughs> so that for one, and I'm so fussy and picky about it. Uh, I don't know. We've switched now to the Salanova's mini heads and um, our yields just went, you know, skyrocket when we, we did that. And, I don't know. I just, I like the, I like the spirit of, of having all this diversity. I I like the, I just like the moment that I'm spending with that crop. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the last purely recreational activity you did, which for you is probably a lot of things because you don't sound like you're so horribly busy. No, no, I am busy. (laughs) I am busy. I just, I, 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 and there's a lot of things that are going on in my life too. Uh, the book and all of that is taking a lot of time away from the farm. So I, um, I, I surf and whenever I can get around and have a session of surfing somewhere, I am the most, uh, happy person can be. You yeah. know that there's no ocean where you live, right? Yes, I know. But there is a river mouth with a permanent wave in Montreal. And as I'm speaking to you now, my wife just delivered the CSA share to everyone. She's going to be sleeping in the van downtown Montreal. And then tomorrow morning at 4.30, she'll be surfing that wave before she comes back to the farm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I envy all these growers that are in California or anywhere else where there's a surf wave not too far. It's just like, for me, that would be the ideal setup to be able to farm and be in the ocean because... 
you know, that's, that's why I like to surf is just to be out outside in the ocean. Yeah. So that's my, uh, that's my awesome. Hobby. Yeah. I love it. And, and if, uh, if you could have a farmer superpower, what would that be? Ah, uh, I would, I would, <laughs> I would, I would take notes every day. I would be a good record keeper. <laughs> <laughs> No, I heard, I heard one of your guests one time say that with his eyes, he would have like Superman and look at all the weeds and they would just disappear. Yes. I, I would kind of like to have that superpower too, because I'm kind of like, I like the farm to be kind of neat. And so, yeah, I'd like that too. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Wow. That's a, um, you know, I wish I had a book like the one I wrote when I started out. It would have saved me so many countless hours of trying to figure out how to do this. And, uh, yeah, uh, I would, I would just try to keep at it, trying to, no, I think I'm, I'm pretty happy where, how it all went down. I think that we did a lot of mistakes, but nothing that was too major that we didn't kind of regret. I think also interns, perhaps they would have to do with interns. We've at first, Chris, we would, we would, we would say to people, we're an intentional community and we would attract right. all these weirdos and, and, and some of them got kind of crazy on us. And, and so we've, we've had to change the wording. And, you know, when we started out, we thought, well, let's just have this kind of like fun and people work whenever. And it was kind of loose and disorganized in a way and it's just attracted so many people that were crazies. So yeah, I would, I would not do that anymore. I would just formalize everything really fast and have a work day and, and a structure. It, 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 it's much better. <laughs> and how I, I should have asked earlier in the interview, JM, how many, how many people are working for you besides you and your wife? There's four of us full time on the farm working from March to November. Okay. And, uh, we have two or three interns, uh, coming for four weeks at a time. And I, okay. us- I usually don't count them as labor because they're not reliable. Sometimes they don't come. Um, a lot of them come from France because my book was, uh, was published in, in, in French first. And then right. they call me the night before and they're like, Oh, JM, you know, I've met this beautiful French Canadian girl. I'm going <laughs> back across Canada. I won't be there tomorrow. And, and, and we just figured out if we're, if we're counting on these guys to get the work done and they're not there, we're really screwed. So we've just kind of like we've organized things. So there's a full workload, the four of us. And then we have more people on the farm. Uh, we sometimes take more time to cook at mealtime or, I take time with them to really trying to, you know, show the tools and how, you know, trying to educate them on, on certain things. So, yeah. Great. JM, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the farmer to farmer podcast today. Hey, Chris, it's been my pleasure. And I have to say, I think this podcast is really amazing. And I think that when we're sharing peer to peer knowledge and experience, that is really, uh, at least for me, it's, it's really uh, heartwarming. So uh, keep up the good work. I really appreciate it. Thank you, JM. It doesn't happen without people like you. All right. Have a good one, guys. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 36 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Fortier. That's F-O-R-T-I-E-R. I'm super excited to announce a series of workshops I'll be doing this fall on employee management. Employees make it possible to get more done, but managing workers and their work takes dedicated time, energy, and processes. I'll be presenting full-day workshops on managing and motivating employees on the farm in Hemingford, Quebec on October 23rd, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on November 30th, and in Columbia, Missouri on December 8th. By the way, Hemingford is just 90 minutes from Burlington, Vermont, if you're interested in jumping across the border to attend. More information, including schedules and registration information, at purplepitchfork.com slash betterboss. If you enjoy the podcast, I think that you would also enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for watering transplants. You can sign up at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. 
Also, if you enjoy the show, it would be fantastic if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. Those reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. And you know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. I know a lot of things, but I know that I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>